it's kind of a return to the old style comedy filmmaking, like the films of Ben Hecht and Howard Hawks. To a large extent, we've been successful of creating a movie of that of that genre. Look, let me give you the lowdown here. Pans down be the funniest movie of the year. The buzz around LA, I mean, everybody wanted to be a part of it. What's the name of this film again? Well, <laughs> it's, it's so kitty and junior high-ish. I read it, but after seeing Clerks, I am. Um... I thought this is extremely commercial. They'll laugh their ass off. I think people are gonna love it. I never could have imagined it being this good. If I've done my job correctly, it's gonna be entertaining. I just hope they love it as much as we do. I mean, you can't lose. When talented people do films that you don't think are good, it's depressing. This was my original review of Moral Rats, appearing in the Los Angeles Times the day the film opened. If the Sundance Institute or the American Film Institute ever offers a course advising directors of successful first films what to avoid their second time around, Mall Rats could be at the heart of the curriculum. You know, it was not my favorite film of the year. Well, it was a, it didn't do very well. As it was certainly not, nobody thought it was a great follow-up to Clerks, let's put it that way. I think there was no question what kind of reviews it was going to get. I do think that he could have made two hours of blank screen and he probably would have gotten those same reviews on a second film. It's just what happens. So the movie comes out and the movie dies. It was like, we're done. Not only are we done, our careers are finished, but like, boy, we humiliate ourselves. Nobody fucking went to the movie. Like when the older character actors were like, this movie's going to be like eye candy, like crack for the kids. And I thought like, no, nah, I don't think so. It seems like nobody seems all that excited about it. And then, you know, it came out and really tanked. I think everybody was disappointed because we thought that the movie had a better chance. Oh, it didn't make any money. Again, being very naive, well, does that, what, what does that mean for the movie, though? Does that mean it's not a good movie? Does that mean people aren't going to like it? What does that mean? I, I genuinely didn't know what that, what that meant. And then when I realized it was definitely a bummer, so that was kind of my first punch in the arm. For me, when I heard it didn't do well opening weekend, it still didn't, it didn't mean anything to me at the time. It was just like, oh, it's a movie, it's great, it's awesome. I called Kevin that weekend, either Sunday or Monday after the weekend to find out how we did opening weekend. And uh, he told me, and he said, isn't it fucking depressing that, that we did all that work for nothing? And that's when it kind of hit really hard. And it was painful, too, because, you know, we had put so much work into it, and it was such a sharp contrast to, you know, riding this huge, amazing wave of clerks. And then suddenly the exact opposite happened, which is complete critical disaster with no financial... I mean, just a bomb that everyone hated. Thankfully, me and Mosier just kind of leaned up against one another. I, I don't think he probably took it as hard as I did. I think it's real hard, because when your movie dies, it's like the whole world rejecting your ideas and or what you hold dear. Essentially, they're going, everything that you thought was important, everything that you think is creative or funny or important or has value, has nothing. Fuck off. And it was really bizarre, because I would never in a million years ever just, like, just tell somebody this, especially if I don't know them. But people have just had no qualms at all about telling me how much this movie sucked <laughs> to my face, you know, constantly, like all the time. And I was like, thanks. <laughs> I liked it and I, I thought it was gonna do well. I don't really go deep into thinking like what went wrong and stuff. Like, wow, if only he didn't this or that. Like, I don't know why and stuff. I just show up and do, have fun. Get off. I just remember enjoying it and thinking it was funny and then being surprised that it hadn't it didn't have the impact yet that it now has, you know, when it came out. But there's always a million factors as to why that happens. When the movie opened and seemed to close within the same weekend, all I could think of was it was obviously because my role wasn't bigger. Stan Lee signing comics. Stanley. Ours was a movie that was aimed very specifically at an incredibly small niche market. And what do you got to do to get comics around this place? One side, Red. When we screened Mallrats at Comic Con, people went crazy. 
Now, to preview a movie at Comic-Con is not exactly giving it the acid test. It's not exactly saying, let's put this in front of the fire and see what happens. We thought we were making a really funny movie. I mean, I, I'm sure Kevin told you we had a screening at Comic-Con, you know, that I swear to God, you know, when you walked out of it, you thought we made Animal House. Look, everyone loves, loved Kevin then, love him now. What can I say? I love the retard. Thought it was extremely funny, think so now. Uh, didn't see any reason why the response at Comic-Con wouldn't be uh, replicated in every mall in America. I think it is a very accurate representation of certain comic book fans who use comic books as their touchstone to most everything else in, in, in going on in their lives. So it, it's a movie that like you, we made for a bunch of people that, you know, even if they all went out in force and supported it, it was still gonna wither on the vine. We made an, an R-rated movie for an audience that couldn't see it because it's R-rated. So the degree to which people over 17 were interested in this picture was limited to, mm, you know, kind of a, a you know, emotionally stunted white boys. You fucker! Uh, you know, who love comic books. It's impossible. Lois could never have Superman's baby. Do you think her fallopian tubes could handle this sperm? I guarantee he blows a load like a shotgun right through her back. It was a treat at Comic-Con, but out there in the cold marketplace, this is not going to be for everybody. It was a stink palm movie. It was a, it was a dirty pants, uh, hands down your trousers type picture, but I needed the uh, 6,000 bucks, so I went down and auditioned for it. <clears throat> there, now you shake hands with the guy. Hey, Mr. Svinning, how have you been? You get a guy who has a hit at Sundance, and very, very soon he's offered a big opportunity to go to Hollywood and make a movie about the Easter Bunny or whatever. Kevin made a movie about guys slugging the Easter Bunny. This is for Brody. Oh. I was trying to enforce the principles of Clerks onto a movie that just would not bear those principles. It, it was needed to be a bigger movie. Their intentions for the movie and the, the, the purest version of the movie, because they're really earnest guys. Um, got got swallowed up sometimes in the in the scale of it. Mallrats, we had easily had a crew of fifty people, and that was weird. Like meeting a production designer, meeting a wardrobe person for the first time. Uh, we met Laura Greenley, who was our line producer. Who we I was a line producer. We already have a producer, you know, Scott Mosher. So it, and and having two more producers in in the persons of Jim Jackson, Sean Daniels. My first experience in making a film with a budget was like, there are far too many fucking people around here. I went from having zero crew, or just, you know, working with Kevin and Scott and a few other people at Hapsack, and a few other people on Clerks, to Mall Rats, where I hired a crew of a camera department of probably seven people, and then a grip department, an electric department, and I had all these people to hire, and, and it was really mind-blowing. I mean, with Mall Rats, it was like, we definitely were like, you know, kids in a candy store, because a lot of the responsibility of like, I mean, especially for me, a lot of the responsibility that I bear now just was distributed to other people. Like, we, we weren't the editors, like all that stuff. So we really were just stuck there going like, try to make this scene funny. Kevin's humor is stuff that does ultimately lend itself to not being terribly commercial because it's much more verbal than it is visual. Well, it's quotable because of the writer, you know. Uh, the guy has a great talent for writing dialogue, and, 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 and it's memorable because of that, and combining the, the, the script with the proper actors and the, the people who are uh, playing the roles. Working with Don Phillips early on, I, I had a good time. I, the casting part was really fun. It's an ensemble movie. And all ensemble movies need a chemistry between the actors. I remember Jim Jacks giving me a call and uh, describing the role to me. Jim Jacks had worked on Tombstone, and Michael Rooker had a smaller part in Tombstone, so he was very friendly with Michael Rooker. He said, what about Michael Rooker? And we were all huge Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer fans. So the idea of Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, Henry playing Brandy's dad, 
like suddenly took this weird turn and jump where it's like, okay, so he's not gonna be a bumbling idiot. He's gonna be, you know, evil incarnate. The show would always run smoother and be less racy. Smetting the show is a piece of shit. A young cast is always exciting. It always has promise. And there's just, there's a certain energy that hopefully comes, comes across on screen. We already kind of had predetermined who we wanted in the movie to see if the chemistry would work. Kevin had written a funny script and he'd written a great character, but you know, it's, it's once you find the person who can put a voice to that, and, and once Kevin connected with Jason Lee and they connected on the character, it was like that's when the movie sort of became. I mean, it defined the whole movie. Jason Lee was just uh, so charming in this, I think, and so, uh, and so surprising that he he could almost could have made this movie work, but <clears throat> but not quite. Don Phillips was really the unsung hero of the entire Mallrats process. Uh, really, he's probably the guy who deserves any credit for any of the good reviews we got because all of the good reviews, which weren't many, cited Jason Lee as the only thing in the movie worth watching. The only thing that saved it was this guy here. Hi, I'm Bentley Garrison with the network. Me and Mason here thought you were hysterical. Mm, hilarious. And we came to Jason Lee because of Don Phillips. Honestly, what I thought is I saw this guy, Jason Lee, and I was like, this dude, Jason Lee, is going to pop off this movie. He's going to have a big, long career. Fill this with Coke, no ice. Want a sip of my soda? That's why I'm here today is because of that movie. So I don't I don't shy away from it and pretend like it never happened by any means whatsoever. I think it's a great movie. I had a great time making Mallrats. It was probably the most fun I've ever had on a movie. Mallrats was this really wonderful uh, fraternal um, experience of shooting a movie where we all lived in the same hotel. And we'd all, at the end of the night, you know, when we were done shooting, we'd all hang out in the hotel bar you know, and sit around and jaw and drink and shit like that. It was sweet. It was real. That, that, was, that was what I remember this, like my first time being away and getting paid a lot of money to me and uh, staying in a hotel and getting per diem and room service and, you know, it, it was great. You know, sometimes you show up and there's not that camaraderie or it's everybody's a little bit distant and you show up, you do your part and you go home and whatever. This had a, I don't know if it was family at that time, it seems like it, it now that we're all a little bit more like family, but um, it was fun. It is kind of like camp. You all come together, you make these fucking strong ties and bonds, you sit around, some dude strums a guitar and you sing songs to one another while roasting wieners, and then you go home. It's all done, you know, and, and you have these wonderful memories and these friendships that you've made and stuff like that that you carry with you through the rest of your life. And that movie was the first time I'd had that experience. He used to be a stand-up kind of guy. What happened to that guy? The guy who punched Amanda Gross's mother after she called him low class. That wasn't me, that was you. Oh, yeah. It wasn't her mother, it was her grandmother. No wonder the bitch went down so fast. There's an obvious timelessness to Kevin's movies that uh, people like. And uh, I think the proof is in the pudding. I mean, people are still talking about it. So uh, I don't really think it's a movie that Kevin had to apologize for. If he felt apologetic about Mallrats, it's because of what happened to him with Clerks. He got so pumped up by having having that kind of critical attention that he went into this one feeling that the critical reception was going to be equally important. In fact, Mallrats has found a life of its own without any help from anybody uh, who wrote about it. The great joy uh, in making the movie and having anything to do with the movie and frankly in seeing the movie is it has Kevin's spirit to it. Kevin Smith is never one to cry quits about anything he does. He knows that there's an audience out there much like uh, Quint and Jaws knows that sharks out there. Uh, Kevin knows that audience is out there and he just has to troll uh, better waters in order to find it. So through the years people would wind up watching it again so it becomes one of those movies because it's very easy to watch, it's very welcoming, and it's got those moments that become classic moments. It's a good DVD movie to sit home and, and like the dialogue and the comics and the just silliness. I think a lot of times when you make movies that are good, 
but they're not, but they don't have easily marketable ideas behind them that they get discovered on, in, on, you know, on, on um, cable and on in video. Then all of a sudden, because they've heard it before, they actually start getting the jokes. And I think the evolution has been that people are starting to, people were able to watch it enough to get the jokes. And then it became a cult classic because people finally got it. Our career to me is like at least 75% born out of home video. The new generations are coming in, ex experiencing it and loving it and bringing chocolate covered pretzels to me. And it's kind of nice. Say, would you like a chocolate covered pretzel? They're a little melty, but damn, are they exquisite. And if I remember correctly, you're a big pretzel fan. You know, I love those things. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> thank you. It really is a movie that speaks to, to uh, young people at a certain time in their life. That time may not be Friday night on the opening weekend of, of, a, of, a, of a new movie when kids want to see something light and fluffy. Um, but that may find it may find them, you know, three years later when they're struggling in college and still kind of of that age and of that mindset, and they and they go like, "Geez, man, I, I passed this one up. I, now I now I really love this." Maybe the mentality of the country has changed, you know, but uh, I think the humor is very witty. I'll tell you what you need is a fatty boom batty blunt, and then I guarantee you see a sailboat, an ocean, and maybe even some of big titty mermaids doing some of that lesbian shit. Look at me, look at me, you sloppy bitch! Maybe all the kids that it missed 10 years ago suddenly finished college and, you know, weren't stoned and could listen to what he was saying with his jokes and get it. The standards of what's acceptable have not tightened over the past 10 years. If anything, they've loosened, and I'm sure stuff that looked kind of, you know, what's the line moves, so what's over the line moves. Our level of discourse has, has sunk so low <laughs> that it, it, for its time, that was a very kind of bad-mouthed, uh, foul-mouthed, uh, out there movie, and it ended with a, with a really dopey quiz show thing. Well, flip ahead 10 years, we have quiz shows on televisions that are much dopier than, than the one he uh, made up for satirical reasons, and this movie's practically clean by the, by the standard of uh, what you can see now. So uh, time has really caught up with it in, in a nice way. Who's your favorite new kid? Huh? Mm. Call me Joey. Uh, yeah, don't make me get loose. I think that's it. Uh, yeah, call me Donnie. Come on. Uh, girl. Yeah, please don't go. Okay? God damn, this is one wacky game show. My guess would be if it's a home video success that very young people are watching it who could not get into the theater even they were too young to even sneak into the theater. First of all, they weren't alive when the film came out, you know, but even if they were, they could have snuck into the theater. I'm guessing that young people are, are fueling this film. I was getting a lot of 15, 16, 17-year-old, 18-year-old kids. Brody, 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 Mallrats, love it. I've seen it a hundred times, blah, 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 blah. Cool, man, cool, that's great, cool. And not too long ago, actually, it kind of stopped me in my tracks one day, and I thought, wait, that kid is like 17 which means he was like seven when the movie came out. And I hadn't even realized that all that time, these kids were coming up to me and shouting Brody, that they were literally seven years old when the movie came out. And that's when it kind of hit me, wow, I guess it's, it's growing, it has a life. A lot of people come up to me, people who are like in college now or high school, end of high school now, and are really into Mars and say the lines, I don't even remember. And I'm like, then it's cursed me, like how old were you when that movie came out? <laughs> We discovered that it became the gateway flick for a lot of people. Like this was the movie that they saw first and then other people would be like, if you like that, this dude's done other movies and then they go find Clerks or Chasing Amy or Dogma. Clerks created our ability to go in and make a studio movie and we went in and did it. And it's the, the failure of that movie, the complete absolute critical and financial failure of that movie created Chasing Amy. And, there, and then the success of Chasing Amy created dogma. In the end, the only thing that really, you can really tell whether the movies are good or not is how long they last. This one seems, you know, look, you're doing a 10th anniversary edition, so clearly it's lasted somewhat. We're gonna do the 20th Geely anniversary. It's gonna be great. It's gonna blow away mall rats. Fucking mall rats. Recording the Q&A, the 10th anniversary thing at the Arclight for the DVD, it was pretty awesome just to sort of, the moment of just seeing everybody 
and seeing everybody much older. We were so young, like Ethan's having a child and Jason Lee as a kid and Kevin and sort of being adults um, and all getting together. It was, it was pretty, it was pretty wild. And then sort of sitting up there with every, the response was great, the audience was great. And, and it really does make you just feel like, wow, how, the, the, it's hard to think about the movie as a failure anymore. All the Mallrats fans are just happy that the film exists. They wouldn't be able to tell you how much money it made opening weekend. And that's what good movies do. So it's had this weird secondary life that is largely responsible for me still making movies today. So that Saturday morning when we got the call that the movie had flopped, you know, the night before, I would, have I would have bet the house on the fact that my career was done and I would never work again. Now, in retrospect, I think because of Mallrats, I've continued to work to this day. Holy shit, motherfucking Yoda and shit. Adventure, excitement, Jedi craves not these things.